Well, can you believe it? We made it to chapter 11. One more after this one, then you don't have to see my mug anymore. <clears throat> I hope it's been enlightening, it's a, it, especially to some point. Interpersonal relationships are something important to all of us. And as such, today we're going to talk about the committed relationships more than anything else. Now, committed relationships are... <clears throat> often hard to come by and they cannot be replaced easily you know there's the old saying that, that there's plenty of fish in the sea well there may be fish out there but you know a lot of them might not be taking your bait so if you have a committed relationship understand that, that they aren't replaced easily and a lot of times it hurts when they're over <clears throat> so Dimensions of a romantic relationship. By the way, I'm not saying stay in a relationship that's not good because it's committed. Please don't think that. Dimensions of a romantic relationship. There's passion. You know, we all have that passion about something or someone. And, and passion is intense positive feelings. But the bad thing about passion is it ebbs and flows. You know, it, it comes and goes. And, and sometimes it, passion's not enough to maintain a relationship. You know, the passion can be great, and when it's hot, it's hot. But when the passion isn't there, if, if there's nothing else to the relationship, it won't sustain. Commitment. Commitment is a decision, not an emotion. You know, when my children were little, and I may have told you all this before, that uh, I told them that, that fairy tale, you meet somebody, you fall in love and live happily ever after is bull. Uh, it is. You know, it is hard work to maintain a relationship. And if you want to maintain a relationship, you have to be committed. Because it's a decision you have to make. I'm going to make it through this. It's not emotion. You know, the passion was the emotion. Intimacy is the closeness the connectedness, and the tenderness. And that's what every relationship needs. You need to have that intimacy. Styles of loving. You know, people say love comes from different places. Does it go, grow from friendship? I had a very close female friend, and one night we had a long discussion about taking our friendship to the next level. And both of us decided that we didn't see a future in that. And so we would rather be friends for the rest of our lives, so to speak, than take it to that physical level and ruin the friendship. So it grew from friendship. Yeah, it can. Um, can you decide on who you're going to love? No, you can't. Okay, I'm going to love that person. You know, we, we end up loving who we love. And it's not a decision you can make. Uh, a lot of times I've found some, there's some people that I love, love to hate and other people that I hate to love. Um, if you get into a relationship and you are not happy, you're going to suffer. If they're not happy, they're going to suffer. A lot of people think of, of love at first sight. Um, I can't say that I ever experienced it myself. <laughs> I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying I haven't experienced it. Um, and many people look at love as a game. And oftentimes in games, there's winners and losers. So if someone you want to be in a relationship with looks at love as a game, it pro and you don't, it's probably not going to be a lasting relationship. Now, there's different styles of love. You know, they have to use all these Greek names and <laughs> all this other stuff. The first one is eros. It's intuitive, it's spontaneous, it's fast, and it's erotic. Men are actually more likely to be erotic lovers than women. And once again, we have these gender-based stereotypes that are 
put in place by the textbook. Um, I don't know, you know, uh, if that's true or not. Storage uh, starts as friendship. It's a love that starts as friendship and compatibility develops. <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of people talk about um, um, when parents, um, can't think of the word right now, folks. Uh, parents find their, their partner, their, their child's partner. Arranged marriage, that's the word I was looking for. And a lot of those people actually fall in love and, and, and actually care about one another and everything else. Uh, they don't necessarily think that you have to be in love to get married. The parents think this is the best one. It works for some people, it doesn't work for others. But storage starts as friendship. And it develops slowly. It's not as much of a roller coaster as Eros is. Ludus is playfulness, games, adventures, scheming. Love's not taken seriously. Um, a lot of people enjoy that that style of love. You know, I'm just in for the fun of it, or here for the fun of it. Um, you don't have the commitment that, that you need for a lasting relationship, in my opinion. But there's nothing wrong, and I honestly think that in my relationship with my spouse, that we've gone through different ones of these at different times. There's times that we want to be playful and adventure and scheming and not be serious. The secondary styles of love are pragma, pragmatic or practical love, you know, um, this person is a good provider. Um, this person good at taking care of the kids. Um, why not? Mania or madness of the gods is a passion of eros, but they play by the rules. Agape um, it's storage and eros combined, it's unconditional love. You know, those of you that are religious and read religious texts, you will know the word agape love is, is an unconditional love. <clears throat> so, how do we manage this stuff? You know, as we grow and change, so may our style of loving. And that's what I alluded to a while ago with oftentimes in my 30 plus relationship with your relationship with my wife, I, I think we've, we've played with many of those styles of loving. Um, is it good or bad? I mean, to be honest, you know, when, as you grow and age and change, you're going to change. Now, if you're in a relationship, you have a couple of choices. You can change together or you can change apart. Uh, if you change a part, uh, the commitment is not there for the relationship. And if that's the case, then you probably didn't have a good relationship to begin with. So how does it develop? Well, Altman and Taylor um, have a theory called the social penetration theory. And the social penetration theory says basically... Um, when you first get to know somebody, you know nothing about them. It's like looking at the outside of an onion. But the closer you get, the more you know them, the deeper you know, the layers you peel away, and the broader the, the breadth of your, your knowledge is. So how can we develop that knowledge in social penetration? Well, there's six stages, individuality, we have our own dislikes and likes and habits. You know, when we first get together with somebody, we're two completely different individuals. And we have to either accept the things about them that we don't like, or we have to um, like them at some point in time. Or, you know, there's maybe things us, us they don't like, you know, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but <clears throat> one of the tirades that my wife has had early on in our marriage was that I put the toilet paper on the roll backwards. Now, 
I never knew there was a right way and a wrong way to do it. But evidently there is. And it's something that mattered to her. To me, it didn't matter. So I adapted. Uh, we need to have invitational communication. Signal your partner your willingness for interaction. You know, I, I mentioned, I know before, when I talked about nonverbal, the look. You know, my wife often has a look. And sometimes that look is, come here, baby, I want you. And sometimes that look is, stay the hell away from me and don't speak to me. Well, if we are going to have a committed relationship, there has to be times, it's not going to be all the time, where you have had to signal there's a willingness for interaction. I want to talk. Um, another stage that you work into is, is hooking up more frequently than dating. You know, you might date this person once a month. Uh, then, you know, hey, it's, it's twice a month. Then it's three times a month. Then it's twice a week. And... Um, and, and something you have to understand too is attraction is culturally dependent. You know, what makes somebody attractive? You know, um, unfortunately, we have a lot of TV commercials that put a false narrative out there of what an attractive woman looks like. Um, back in the centuries ago, if you look at a lot of sculptors, women were uh, much larger. You know, when they do a sculpture or a painting of a woman, <clears throat> their models were <clears throat> larger, more voluptuous, more curves. Culturally, you know, we, we say no, or I'm not going to say we, culturally in America, you know, thin fit is, is more attractive. Um, internet dating is, is something that many people are doing nowadays. I can remember when it started. Yes, I'm that old. Um, I never internet dated. I was already married by then, and my wife wouldn't let me. But that's okay. I wouldn't let her either. But the problem with internet dating is is often the same problem you have in, in, in person dating. You know, how honest is this person being? Well, it's much easier to lie via the internet than it is in person. You know, I could tell you I'm six foot six, but when you meet me, you would know that I'm only six foot two. So there's some things that can be lied about very easily. Um, other things that, that internet, I'm not saying everybody on the internet is dishonest, but everything on the internet isn't true. So it's something that you need to uh, be careful of. Um, explorational communication. Uh, is deeper communication looking for commonalities? You know, when we meet originally, you know, we, we might talk to somebody and find out that they like the same sports team. Or we might meet at, you know, and, and say, okay, let's, let's go to dinner. And we find out that they like Italian food or, or they like sushi. So, explorational communication is, is beyond that. It goes deeper, you know. Um, what do you think about family? What do you think about politics? What do you think about finances? Looking for deeper, you know, commonalities. Well, family's great. You know, I want to have a bunch of kids. Well, I don't want to have any kids. So, you know, we're going to find out now that maybe we don't need to be together. Um, intensifying communication. Euphoria, spend more time together. Uh, you're more of an exclusive couple. But one thing that comes along with that is, is there's a term many of you may not be familiar with. It's called rose-colored glasses. And rose-colored glasses means that you only see the good things. So sometimes spending that much time together you, you see the the only the positive and not the negative, and it's hard to see that. And revising communication. 
you know, if you've taken group comm, you know about forming, storming, norming, and performing. Well, it's the same for an individual relationship. Um, you're going to, when you first get together, you're forming. You're both on your best foot, put your best foot forward. <laughs> you both try to make sure the other one likes you. Um, and then you start getting the, 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 the storming part comes when you realize that this person isn't quite what you had expected. Um, this person isn't, uh, you know, like putting the toilet paper on the wrong way. Um, and then it causes the conflict. Um, you might find yourself asking, why am I here? Is she or he the right person for me? Um, you know, they don't, they don't understand this is what I want uh, out of life. Um, and commitment. You know, most people get married, they, they, they make vows for better or worse, for richer or poorer, till death do us part. Um, the question is, do you mean those words when you make that commitment? You know, I'm going to stay and make this happen. Or is it one of those things that passion has gotten in the way and you think, yeah, this is going to be great. And then find out all of a sudden it wasn't as great as you thought it was. Now, I talked to y'all about Conville's helical model of a relationship in a previous video. And I put a diagram at the bottom of my speaker's notes so you can see it. But... Um, the, the idea is to keep the relationship intimate, satisfying, and healthy. In Conville's model, you're going to be at one point where everything's great. And then the next point, it's not great. And you're going to work around in a circle. The question is, are you going to climb in a circle and become closer or a better relationship? Or are you going to decline and fall apart? So deterioration is sometimes abrupt. Sometimes uh, people drift apart. Sometimes it's aggressive. You know, I teach um, group comp. And my general rule of thumb is I will assign the groups. You will be in that group and I'm not changing them. Strictly because in the real world, if you go to work for somebody or you go out and <clears throat> they are going to at some point in time say, you're in this group and you got to work with those people. And I think it's pretty much should be the same way in college. But one day I may assign groups and a girl came in and she said, I can't be in that group. And I said, yes, you can. And she said, no, you don't understand. I can't be in that group. And I said, why not? Well, last night I got home and caught my boyfriend in bed with another girl. That was a very aggressive and abrupt end to that relationship. By the way, I asked her which group she wanted to be in. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out he went into a different group because the rest of that group was, was were close friends of her sorority sisters. <clears throat> and so he wasn't comfortable there at all. But, you know, sometimes it's that, uh, that abrupt and that aggressive. It's over, you know. Other times, <clears throat> people just grow apart. <clears throat> Their um, likes and, and, and desires drift apart their desire to make their significant other happy drifts apart. Their um, commitment to the relationship drifts away. And, and they just become functioning day-to-day -day zombies, for lack of a better word. You know, a lot of people stay together. We'll, we'll, we're going to stay together for the kids. And so they, they stay together. They're not happy. But when they, they lose that commitment to stay together for the relationship and shift it to we're going to stay together for the kids, then the intimacy, their passion, it drifts away as well. And so oftentimes they start looking for something else, somewhere else. Um, intrapsychic, where one or both feel dissatisfied. You know, there's a lot of relationships where one person 
is not satisfied, and they go out running around. And there's other ones where both of them are not satisfied. Like I mentioned earlier, if they, well, we'll stay together for the kids. Well, neither one of them's happy, neither one of them's satisfied, but they're staying together just for didactic is the breakdown of, of established patterns. You know, what patterns do the two of you have in your relationship and, and how have they changed? <laughs> you know, social support is looking outside of the partnership for, for support. And, and you hear that all the time with whatever TV show you want to watch. You know, you weren't there for me. Um, I, I saw a video of this guy wanted to be a father really bad and his quote girlfriend got pregnant and they broke up with his wife and found out when the baby was born it wasn't his you know and then he saw his ex-wife and found out she was had a, had a baby um you know he went outside of the relationship looking for something that he didn't think she could give him and it turned out he was the one that was the problem um grave dressing you know, accepting the end is evident and and getting ready for it. And I love the descriptive term they use here, grave dressing is, and, and, and I'll tell you why, my sister-in-law recently passed away from cancer. And when the doctors gave her a certain amount of time, you know, with chemo, without chemo, she did chemo, she couldn't handle it anymore, it didn't help. Uh, but... It was definitely in conversations with her, grave dressing, getting ready for the end. And um, not only of her relationship with, with my brother-in-law, but um, her life, you know, and, and things that she would say, you know, like, I, I want y'all to come see me before I die. Um, that, that, you know, hits you hard, uh, especially if, if you aren't ready for it like that person is. And you see that happen in relationships. You know, the end is evident. I know we're not going to make it. So we might as well just start preparing for it now. And finally, resurrection is moving on. You know, after a relationship is over, there's life after the relationship. You know, it's like being born again. Uh, but you don't really know how to date because you haven't done it in so long. And the world's changed. But when you are, after you move on, you have to do a few things, especially in today's world. You have to engage in a dual perspective. You know, what do I want out of this and what do you want out of this? Uh, practicing safe sex. Having a talk about sex. Um, it's, it's difficult. Sometimes it's a difficult subject to, to bring up, especially if you haven't had sex with a person before. <laughs> but if you're going to be in an intimate relationship, you need to know what's been going on. Uh, so you need to have that conversation. Uh, a lot of people say, well, it's easy to have on the Internet. Well, the problem on the Internet is, once again, not always true. So, uh, you know, something you need to worry about. And, and it's, and people often manipulate it. If you meet somebody at church and you're really religious and they, well, put it this way, a friend of mine was on a religious singles website and within the first week had four different guys hit her up for money, you know, and they weren't there necessarily for the same thing she was there for. <laughs> but they thought they had a target because she was gullible because she was religious. And at least that was their perspective of it. So, you know, you have to have that talk and, and you have to try to figure out if they're being honest with you. Uh, manage conflict constructively. You know, romantic bonds are fragile and they mean a whole lot. And I know I've talked to y'all about this before, but remember the, 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 the tube of toothpaste? It comes out quick, but it doesn't go back in. So um, you're going to have to to learn how to communicate and and be gentle, shall we say? 
you know, I, I know I've told you that that I don't necessarily believe in one hundred percent honesty. If my my wife did something and and my mom did it better, you know, cooked a meal, uh, I'm not going to say, well, it's okay, but mom's was better because it's going to hurt her. It may be true, but there's no reason to go down that road. <laughs> so you know, do I want to hurt the person that I'm committed to? For no reason whatsoever? No, I don't. Um, for those of you that haven't figured it out yet, and, and I hope most of you do know what's going on, and that is violence is not romantic. You know, um, if there's violence in a relationship, then somebody needs to reassess the relationship. Not only violence, but manipulation of any sort, sexual, financial, physical, um, that's not good in healthy relationship. And the problem with it is not always reported. You know, if, if you see your friend um, in that type of relationship, you know, a lot of times they're embarrassed to admit it, even to their close friends. So it's something that you need to be aware of as a friend, but it's something you need to be aware of in your own relationships. In long distance relationships, <clears throat> I love this part of the book because I actually lived in a period of time where there were long distance relationships. And, and some people would argue now that, oh, well, you know, my, my, my boyfriend or my girlfriend is in da 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 da. And so we have a long distance relationship. I'm talking about the time where I had to physically write a letter, mail it. It took a week for them to get it, it took a couple of days for them to respond, and a week for me to get a response. You know, that's a two week period that we're talking about between in the conversation. Or if, if, if I did make a phone call, um, yeah, we're, there was phones back then. I'm not quite that old. But if I did make a phone call, the um, I had to generally stand in line for 20 minutes when I was in Europe <laughs> to get to the phone because everybody else was trying to make calls because they had very few phone phones you could use. And it cost me about $20 for five minutes. And $20 back then was a hell of a lot of money. Um, you know, so it'd be like $100 now for five minutes. So cost of phones was, was just outrageous. So it was a long distance relationship. Now you get on Zoom, you get on Snapchat, you get on, on, on Google Friends, you get on internet you have video feed real time daily you know it's 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 a different perspective but there is still some adaption in long distance relationships you know i'm not saying it's completely wrong nowadays but um intimacy you know it it's we want to be touched you know and, and not having that physical contact is is difficult at times especially now you know with the pandemic one of my my close friends that in rotary she and i were talking one night and she said you know what i miss more than anything else is, is just a hug <laughs> and there's an adaptation if you're in a long distance relationship you know you're not going to have that physical contact that you would have if the person was there and you have to be willing to forego that for that period of time if you want the relationship to work. Now, the next thing in my speaker's notes are the diagram from Conville and uh, another diagram for, for about cultural adaptation. But they talk both talk about basically how uh, it's, the relationship is a helical curve. You know, it's going to spin around and around and you're either going to adapt and grow or you're going to fall apart. So that's chapter 11. I look forward to recording chapter 12 next week and telling you all this is it. Hopefully the class has been going well. I did have somebody ask me about the self-reflection paper. The self-reflection paper is simply a paper saying this is how I grew as uh, interpersonal uh, uh, through my level of interpersonal communication has grown. 
If you didn't get anything out of the class because you already knew it all along, okay, fine. You know, just, just say that. If you got something out of it, if you were able to better handle your relationships, great. Tell me that. What I like about self-reflective papers is, you know, I can't say you're wrong because that's your opinion. But I can tell you if it's well written or not. So, any questions, concerns, you all have my email. You have my phone number. Contact me. Be safe. Have a great day. Bye.